it's really hell on earth. I, you know, this, this is what shipbreaking in Bangladesh is. You can actually see these, these ships from space, if you Google it, that are run up on the beaches of Bangladesh. These children and young workers go in with absolutely no safety gear, and they dismantle the ship completely. The ship is just cut to pieces with these blow torches. Uh, it just disappears. The cutters are on the ship, inside the ship, and they're cutting these gigantic metal plates off the sides of the ship. They fall into the sea, or they fall into the sand. There's groups of workers called loaders, and the loaders do nothing all day but pick up those big sheets, hoist them up, and put them on their shoulder. The things weigh like tons, and it's so heavy that they have a chanter who holds on to the back of the, the, the metal and chants, and you have to step in unison. If you step out of chant, the thing's going to crush you. They resemble slaves, and they're walking around either barefoot in flip-flops over broken metal and glass. They have no safety gear, so like it's not like they go in with hot hats. They don't go in with visors because the sparks are flying. When you're, when you're using that blowtorch at the metal, the sparks are just flying everywhere. So what they do is they go in with a baseball cap for a hot hat. What they do is wear sunglasses for a visor. And what they do for a respiratory mask, they wrap their face in a dirty bandana. It's absolutely hideous. The biggest fear when you're cutting the ship to pieces is that you're going to be burning into a chamber that has gas fumes in the gas vapors, and there's going to be an explosion. And this is very common. The government doesn't document anything. The ship owners don't document anything. They don't document or investigate the killings and the injuries. Uh, they just throw the people back into their villages. In some cases, we've heard they throw the dead bodies into the water. We interviewed one worker who was cutting a large piece of the ship inside. And he went outside because they had run out of oxygen for the, the blowtorch. And he hooked it up. And just as he was hooking it up, he turned around, and a big piece of the ship fell on him. And it hit the tank and smashed the tank into his back, the oxygen tank. And it broke him, his back in half, broke his backbone. He's paralyzed now, and he can move his head and he can move his arms, but he can't sit up. He has no feeling in his stomach or his back or his legs. He doesn't, he eats, but has no feeling of eating. He can't control his bowels, he soils himself and he's laying in his mother's house, no mattress, just laying on the dirt, and, you know, his life is over, young man. And there's just story after story like this. I mean, you're talking about a worker dying every three weeks, and you're talking about serious injuries every single day. Last year, a third-year-old child, um, his very first day on the job, uh, was hit in the head with a heavy piece of metal and just died immediately, a 13-year-old kid. So, but local estimates think about 25% of the workers are between 10 and 17 years of age. So um, basically the kids are the helpers. They help the, the, the cutters who operate the blowtorch. They go after the asbestos. And the way they do it is with a hammer. They smash it because often there's wire holding the asbestos on. So they smash it with a hammer to break it apart, shovel it into a plastic bag and carry it outside the ship. You're talking about 15,000 pounds of asbestos in every ship. The lead paint on each ship varies from, from 10 tons to 200 tons. I mean, it's just so much toxic waste, everything imaginable. Dioxin, mercury, arsenic, on and on. All of that's just leaching into the sand and then going out to sea. So everything's dead. So it's not just the worker rights, it's also the, the, the complete, complete destruction of the environment. It will cost $350 to outfit every worker with the necessary protective gear. The most expensive part of the gear being a respiratory mask that would handle the lead paint, the dust, and could handle the asbestos dust. It's nothing. $350 could save these workers' lives. It could be safety belts. It could be the vest, the welder's vest. It could be the, the, the hot hat. It could be the visor. I mean, it's criminal.
They work 12 hours a day. For wages of between 22 cents an hour, these are like average wages for, for helpers, to 32 cents an hour for the people who cut the ships to pieces. And they leave there having worked 12 hours all night long, and they go back to this miserable hovel, and it's not like they can take a shower. There are no showers. Their shower is a water pump that 50 workers share, and you just pump water into a small plastic bucket, and you're supposed to wash all of that asbestos off. You're supposed to wash the oil off. You're supposed to get one day a week off. Well, not here. You work seven days a week. They're supposed to have, you know, sick days and national holidays, just like any other country, and a vacation. They don't have any of that. And they, they tell us flat out, we have no life. You know, we just, we work. We have to do this for our families. This work is gonna shorten our lifespans. We have to die in order to live, they tell us. These shipbreaking jobs really are the last cycle of the global sweatshop economy. And it should frighten us, and it should wake us up. In the United States, there are still four places left that dismantle ships where you go into a dry dock so you can contain the, the pollution. People with moon suits go in and take out the asbestos and take out the poisons and the other toxic chemicals. Well, of course, you have to pay them a decent wage. These places in the United States are not going to survive. Who's going to pay to have a ship dismantled where workers' rights are respected and they earn a living wage and the environment's protected? No one does that anymore. I've never seen anything like the conditions in Bangladesh in the shipbreaking industry. I mean, this is outright murder of workers. This is outright maiming of workers, burning of workers, injured workers, cheated of their wages, doing perhaps the most dangerous job in the world for 22 to 32 cents an hour. This was not going on for 30 years. It, it speaks volumes about how badly the international, international institutions have failed workers. I'm talking about the World Trade Organization, obviously. Now with the G20, obviously. With, even with the ILO. We need to hold these global institutions accountable as the G20 people talk with the mouth, the leaders, workers continue to be injured, maimed, and killed, and cheated in Bangladesh. Um, if we're not challenging the, D the G20, if we're not challenging the World Trade Organization, uh, we're just gonna go down, because they don't care. They're not gonna do a single thing to protect a worker, not a single worker. Whether the workers in the United States or the workers in Bangladesh, the World Trade Organization is not gonna lift one single finger. And sadly to say, the ILO talks, but nothing changes. And so we have to be quite frightened. We're alone, and we better start speaking up because there's nothing out there that's going to speak for us. We've got to speak for ourselves.